I was uh, in England from January the 1st, uh, 1944 till July 44. I was in on the D-Day events and I put in my three missions and returned to the States and was an instructor B-17 pilot training new crews that were on their way over. I uh, uh, got out of the service and did not go near a B-17 again until uh, last year and I found out about this Collings Foundation project. This is a uh, uh, non-profit organization. These uh, planes are on tour the year round. It's an educational project and it's funded by donors, strictly by a donor program. People that come out and make donations to go through the planes, the people make donations to fly as passengers on the planes and so forth. And that's the way we keep the planes in the air. They have quite an expense in uh, maintenance and of course in the daily operation of these planes and it takes quite a few dollars to make it fly. And um, we have been on our winter tour, which is the, throughout the state of Florida. We started about the first week in January. We'll complete it along about the third week of March. Then we'll take off for a couple of weeks and we start the spring, summer, and fall tour. And we'll head across the southern states in through Georgia and uh, Texarkana, Texas, and across then into New Mexico and on out to Arizona. And we'll head on into uh, San Diego and we'll work the stops at various intervals up the California coastline. We'll go up on up through Riverside and uh, those points, going into um, Eureka, California and Crescent City, that's up near Oregon. Then we'll work uh, Washington and then we'll head back across central United States through the Midwestern states and head on back into the Eastern states. And then along uh, late in the season when the weather begins to get cold again, then we head back down toward the Midwest and the Southwest, and we'll work uh, some Texas, Oklahoma, and Louisiana stops, and then back across, and we winter the planes here in Florida. Uh, the home of these planes is in Stowe, Massachusetts. Now, that's a suburb of Boston. The planes are owned by a Mr. Bob Collings of the Collings Foundation. This is one of his pet projects. He's a uh, internationally known collector of vintage aircraft and vintage automobiles. He has a multi-million dollar collection of vintage automobiles along with his aircraft. The name of this B-17 is the 909. This plane now did not see combat. Uh, it came uh, off the blocks in uh, 1945, but this plane was named in honor of the original 909 that was with the 91st Bomb Group at Bassingbourne, England. The original 909 flew more missions than any other B-17 or B-24 without an abort, did not have to abort a mission, no injuries, and it flew 140 missions. So this plane was named in honor of the original 909. Basically, it's the Collins Foundation that operates these two aircraft, a nonprofit organization. And um, I've got in it from my brother, uh, who's also a pilot over here. Uh, we both work for a major airline and uh, we pretty much we travel around the country with these two airplanes flying them from city to city and uh, displaying them for a uh, static display for people that uh, have a lot of uh, nostalgic about these airplanes a lot of heritage so, uh, as you can see many people out here today uh, ser served world war ii with with these as gunners engineers pilots themselves and um, it's very important for a lot of these people to remember it on the 50th anniversary uh, of world war ii That's a good way to start a fight with some people, but uh, <laughs> personally, I prefer the B-17. Uh, I'd like a tailwheel airplane. So, why why is that uh, a point of contention between pilots? Uh, well, carpet? the people who flew the B-24s in combat love the B-24, and the people that flew the B-17, they love their B-17. And you get the two of them together, and they're almost automatically going to argue. It's the lifelong argument going on. That uh, you know, but I think basically what happened was whatever airplane got you back from combat was the one you liked. 
Well, that makes sense. A lot of wisdom in that state. Yeah. Which uh, which one's easier to maintain from a mechanic? Uh, from a mechanic standpoint, the B17 is a little easier just because it's got a single row of cylinders on the engine, whereas the B24 has a double row. And they were designed. B24 was designed that if uh, damage was incurred in the field, it took over six hours to fix. You change the engine. You didn't change a cylinder in the in the field. You put you put the 14 connections and four bolts. You can have the engine off and on the ground. I think they built 186,000 of those B24 engines that you know used on other aircraft also. So there's no shortage of them. They had them set up with all the accessories on. You just take that one off, put it on the ground, and about six hours later you put your new one on and, and run it. Well now the engines that are in these planes, are they original engines? Uh... Yeah, the original style engine. They've all been freshly overhauled. I'd say all eight engines have a little less than 30 hours on them. Now that means uh, the parts are pretty much new, made. Everything new is remanufactured, remanufactured inside. You know, bearings and uh, pistons and rings and and rods and all that stuff. It's been gone through, checked the original specifications. So they are made to the original specifications. Yep. Yep. It's yeah, that's uh, to maintain the authenticity. Well, it's to, it's to maintain the authenticity to one point, but it's also kind of what else would you put on? There's not a whole lot. You, know, you really couldn't put a more modern power plant on there that would fit look decent at all and still give you the performance that these do. A radial engine has the highest power output to weight ratio of any piston engine. Both these planes are uh, owned and maintained by the Collins Foundation. Can you tell us uh, something about the Collins Foundation? Sure, I'd be glad to. It's a, uh, it's a non-profit organization designed to take World War II aircraft and other historically significant aircraft and restore them to a flying condition, not just statically sit them on, you know, on the ground for people to walk around and see, but tour them around the country, generate the funds to offset the uh, $2,000 an hour operating cost of each airplane, and uh, actually get them to the point where people can actually see them. You can get up, you can walk through, you know, the grandfather can take the grandson or granddaughter through or the family through and say, this is, my, this is my gun, this is what I did, and this is where I plugged in my heated suit, and this is how I I made it through all my combat missions and it gives them a, an idea, it brings a reality to people that yes it really did happen and yes there was just thin aluminum separating me from 60 degree below zero temperatures and flak and fighters and uh, so that's I think one of the most important things of the foundation and plus you get to see the airplanes you know we fly in we fly out and people see them as, as you know as I personally feel where they should be is up in the sky. And how long has the foundation been in existence? I believe the foundation's been around for a little better than 10 years, and we have right around 12 different airplanes. How much of a challenge was it when they founded the foundation to go about collecting the parts and planes and pieces to get this thing off the ground? It, uh, it's been an ongoing thing. It started with the B-25 Mitchell uh, in 85, and then the, the B-17 was purchased. Uh, and after that, the real, the, the big project became the B-24. The B-24 was originally just going to be a static display. In fact, the Smithsonian looked at that airplane and said it was too far gone for, for what they wanted to do because they don't have a B-24. Uh, Bob Collins purchased the airplane and was approached by some veterans groups and said, you know, we'd really like to have you consider restoring the airplane to flying status so we can have one go around. And this is the only operating It's the only flying, flying fully restored B-24 in the world. Now, there is another B-24 that flies, but it is unrestored. Now, as far as finding parts for it, metal for the skin for damage or anything, is that uh, No, it's not too bad. Things like air, the skins, or aluminum is pretty much aluminum. If we have to get into spars and bracings and things like that, well, we might get into machining things and, and, and areas like that. And that can get pretty pricey pretty quick. Um, I think they figure for every hour we fly, it ends up being at the end of the year a little more than 30 hours of maintenance put in. But there's trip. no aircraft graveyard they could go to to find some. Well, there was parts. up uh, out in Arizona. Everybody, you know, it's a commonly asked question about the aircraft graveyard. But the things that are there now are 707s, DC-10s, and more modern jet aircraft. The uh, the World War II era airplanes, because of their increasing value and the, you know the amount of time they were in the graveyard, and just they're gone. Now the tour that you're on that that covers how long of a period? Uh, well, we'll have. We'll start in the middle of January and we end about the middle of November when we usually take about two weeks uh, towards the end of March where we uh, finish up our tour of Florida and go through the airplanes in preparation for our national tour. <laughs> All told, it's probably in the area of, I would think, about 150 cities this year. And uh, how many hours of flying time would that be? Well, I would say between two and three hundred hours a year is what we put on the airplane, which for these type of airplanes is quite a lot, but mechanically speaking, it's... Uh, 
probably the best thing for them to have them sit for a few weeks is things set up on you and you end up having more problems than if you flew it every day. And then that times two thousand dollars an hour per plane roughly and you can see how that adds up. It adds up very quickly. Which uh, they probably rely heavily on volunteers to help. Yeah, we do a lot of volunteer, uh, a lot of volunteers on our restorations and the main source of revenue for the foundation, you know, we do have some corporate sponsors, you know, the champion will do spark plugs and good year work, workout deals with us on tires, which basically just means, you know, that they make them and things like that. Um, but the main source of revenue for the foundation and for keeping the airplanes flying is just by people coming out and touring them and, uh, and the donation at the gate. I was with the 15th Air Force, stationed in the heel of the boot of Italy. It was our job to fly into the Balkan countries and into southern Germany and northern Italy, southern France, to, to do what we could to whip the enemy. I was uh, one of the fellows that flew five times over the Ploesti oil fields in Romania. It took 300 missions for our Air Force to knock out that oil refinery that the Germans depended so much on. But I happened to be lucky enough to be on the last one that we finally knocked it out. The B-24 has a pilot, co-pilot, bombardier, navigator, radio man, tail gunner, two waist guns, an upper turret, a lower turret and a nose gunner. Your seat on this plane was? The nose turret. It was my job to inform the bombardier when the lead ship would uh, open up its bomb bay doors and I would inform the crew that the bomb bay doors were open. And when that lead ship would drop his bombs, I would inform the bombardier, bombs away. And he, along with all of the other planes in that group, would drop their bombs at the same time. We would get up early in the morning, we would start out on a mission after our briefing, and the average run would run about nine hours from the time we took off until the time we landed. The important thing was that after we reached the 10,000 foot level, we had to be on oxygen, and we were on oxygen approximately eight hours of the trip. While I was over there, it was a very intense time because it was getting near to the point where we were really getting ahead of the Germans. On one occasion, when a crew that was tented next to ours took off with us, and unfortunately, I happened to be able to see that a Ju-88, which is a German light bomber, hit the bomber that they were in head-on. And of course, both of them were destroyed, and the fellas in the 24 never knew what hit them. The amazing thing about the story is that when we got back after our debriefing, we went back to our tent, and on the way over, before we got to uh, our station, these fellas picked up a monkey while they were coming through South America. And uh, it was their pet. And knowing that they were gone and we were checking around their tent, we got there, the monkey was dead. I was a flight engineer. And a flight engineer on this plane means what? Well, I, I did all the little things that it made, took to make it fly that the pilot and the co-pilot didn't do. I did all the gas transfer and I read the instruments and, and did the flight deck work that needed to be done. And in addition to that, I flew the uh, top turret gun. I was a gunner. When we was in combat, that was my position. One of the interesting things to me about this airplane here is the resiliency of it and how strong it was. And the beating we took in the 
on a particular fluorescent rage where we took a lot of flack and and uh, we survived. We got back. I flew every position on that plane one time simply because I wanted to know how it was in each position. The lonesomest position on this plane was a ball turret. When they let you down in that thing, all you could see was the end of these props right here. And uh, you just felt kind of by yourself down there. How many missions did you fly? I flew 51 missions out of Italy. Now, is was 50 a magic number? 50 was the come home number. The come home number. Yeah. We, uh, the weather 51 came in on long missions, like 11 hour missions, when we're going up into the interior part of Germany. We got double, we got two missions for one. And that's how we went over, and that's how we come 51 missions. Now, did you always fly on the same plane? Yeah, yes, sir. We sure did. We lost one plane, and we got it repaired and used it again. We were shot up over Ploesti, where ordered to bail out, really, over Yugoslavia. And when we got to the emergency field, three B-24s had already crashed land on the field, and we couldn't get in. So we decided to take that plane to Barry, Italy, and we did. And we didn't have any hydraulic system. One of our engines was gone. One was running rough. We had to dump out this nose gear here by manually dump it out. And uh, when we hit the ground and the airplane slowed low enough, we ground looped it. And that's these tricycle landing gears. We went down the thing that way, and that's how we stopped it and landed, and we all walked away from it. accumulate in the B-24? About 3,500 hours. And most of all of them were right in the back end? Yeah, I took that. I took that because most of them on our ship was bigger men. And I fit it in that they said for So that's where I went. And the average uh, mission was about how long? Well, we run from it. The mission don't usually run but about an hour. But a lot of times you had to be in that hour before you get to your destination and then you're in it for another hour, and maybe an hour coming back. But then you can get out of it when you run out of, where you're not, you're afraid someone's coming in on you, see. We was patrolling the coastlines, what we was doing. We was looking for subs. So, actually they bombed anything or shot up anything up front. And Captain Allen, he was our pilot, he said, sure, if you see anything floating back there, go ahead and shoot it. <laughs> so nothing was safe. No. <laughs> no, you would. They said that uh, actually, oh, uh, actually, lifetime in that turret in actual combat was three seconds. So you either had to be on your toes or you wouldn't be there. About uh, on these patrols, about uh, what was the altitude you were flying in? Very low. Sometimes right down on the water, and sometimes around 2,000 feet. A bit about. Closer well, to the ground, the easier it was closer, to shoot yeah. at you. Unless we was actually looking. But you could see a sub way down deep in the water. You know, you could see them in the, in the water moving before you could. Of course, I didn't get to see. And this was in the Mediterranean? In the Pacific. In the Pacific? Yes, sir. And uh, so we was in and out. We'd go in and out, and then we'd have to go in different places to gas up, fuel up, check in check our plane and everything and reload and what have you. So, so your time in this uh, aircraft was in the Pacific Theater yes, during sir. the war? Mm -hmm. I've got one plane to my credit. That's a lot of hours just get one plane. <laughs> I guess it was worth it. And now that would have been what, a Japanese uh, Zero yes, or yes, sir. one of those? Mm -hmm. So this plane saw activity in both the European Theater and the Pacific Right. A lot of times they'd call us off to run a bombing mission. So we'd go out and run a bombing mission when we'd go right back to the water again. Or some of us had to, and a lot of them didn't like it. So we did, so they kept us out there most of the time. So yeah, we was trying to come into uh, Peterson Field, Colorado, and we had engine trouble. We lost two engines. Pilot gave us one bell, we had to put on our shoes. And uh, 
number three engine started cutting up on us. So he gave us another bail. So that means bail out. So I bailed out of that, but my parachute wouldn't tighten up on me. And I busted both of my legs here whenever I pulled the chute. It busted both of my legs. I, I didn't know it until after I done got down, after I done landed. But it busted both my legs. That's the reason I can't walk when I get cold. I have to swing my body or get somebody to help me walk in cold weather. I can't move them. So I then they end up. So you had you had to bail out of them. Yes, sir. I was but 24. And then uh, I stayed in the hospital about. Well, I stayed in there 30 days, and then I had to go back every week to get checked out. And then I went in to see the colonel one day and see him about getting back on the plane. He said, well, Shorty, he said, I got news for you. He said, let a paper out there. He said, you're going to Eglin Field. I was 44. So I came to Eglin Field. They wouldn't let me fly because they said it was too dangerous for if I had to leave it again, they might, have, might lose two legs. So I came back to the field and I was here. I got out, got married down here, and uh, I've been here. Well, actually it wasn't flying, it was while I was in the aircraft. And uh, it was foggy over in England. And two aircraft run together right on the runway and I was just a few, couple of hundred yards from it. And, uh, I was in my airplane and had to go out through the Bombay doors and get on out. And the two planes blew up, of course, whenever they hit and caused quite a concussion. Bodies and everything else was flying around there. But uh, that stuck in my mind because the blast did knock me down coming out from it. How old were you when you served in World War II? I was 22 whenever I first went in. Volunteer? Yes. Volunteer. Straight for B-17s to fly? No, I just volunteered in the Army Air Force, it was called then, and uh, went to flight um, into uh, basic training in Shepherd Field, and then to school in Yakima, Washington, and out to New York, California, with the 305th Bomb Group, where Colonel Kurt LeMay was our CO at the time of the 305th Bomb Group. And in September of 42, we went to uh, England, and uh, I went over on the Queen Mary going over, but coming back, well, I flew back. And all your missions over Germany were out of England? Right, out of, out of Shelveston Field, going in different parts of England. What I mean, of Germany. What were you flying in 17 during the war? Uh, from 42 to uh, July of 45, September of 42, we got over there. And, uh, July right 45. Maybe, right early on and then all the way through the main part of the war. Well, that's right. I was right, right in from the first, well, first did part the, of it. Did the 50 mission rule apply to flight engineers? No. Did the other people? We had 25 missions on the B-17s and then they could come back to the States. And how many total did you have? Well, like I say, I didn't really fly too many missions uh, during World War II. I was crew chief. And uh, I actually really just had one mission. But, uh, well, is it a pretty reliable airplane? Best that's ever made, in my opinion. Very durable. Take a lot of flight. Take a lot of a lot of gunfire. They can still fly. Well, I think Collins Foundation is a wonderful organization. They're trying to instill in everybody what had happened during the war to. Uh, honor all the veterans from the wars and this is a non-profit organization that and the only way they can keep these planes in the air is by uh, contributions by anybody and everybody and right now today anything they can get pays for the gas because it costs over two thousand dollars an hour to keep these planes in the air and anything they make above uh, the price of gas any profit they're put back into the organization because they're working on a B-25 restoring that and I believe an F4U Corsair and uh, I think they said possibly a TBF Avenger. So we hope to see them in the air shortly too. Now you had an interesting experience yesterday I believe. Yes, 
And I had a chance to fly into B-24, and after we were in the air, they let me sit in the co-pilot seat, and I flew the plane for a little while. So that was a, a dream come true. But something else happened, I think. Uh... Oh, I had some parts from the Lady Be Good, which was a bomber they found in the North African desert in 1959. I believe it had crashed in 1943. And I had parts from that plane, and I took them on board with this B-24 here. And I believe there is a um, superstition behind that, that other planes that took parts off that plane had crashed. Well, I said, I don't believe in it, and I'm going to debunk that, excuse me, <coughs> theory. So I took the parts with us on board the plane. Nothing happened. We got here safe and sound. But, of course, it made the pilot nervous. So I said, no. So one more superstition quell. I, th I thought it was quell, but then they told me later today, some people read the article in this morning's paper that I had in there about it, and they said, no, the parts had to be fastened down to the plane. And I said, well, I didn't hear that part of it. I think they were just trying to keep it going. But my main aim was to get the parts from the Lady Be Good back in the air after 52 years and to honor the memory of those guys and all veterans. For any further information, you can write to the Collins Foundation, 137 Barton Road, Stowe, Massachusetts, 01775 on the zip code, or you can even call 508-568-8924, and they'll be happy to give you some more information.